I am overjoyed and delighted to introduce you to our entrepreneur spotlight speaker this morning. Ms. Oni Bell is an acclaimed business strategist, serial entrepreneur, nonprofit executive, and author. She is the founder and CEO of Black Girl Management Foundation, a transformative platform that funds tech-enabled businesses founded by people who identify as Black, Brown, and woman. She has scaled over 100 businesses across various sectors. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Ms. Omi Bell. Hello. I am so sorry to not be joining you in person, mainly because I'm going to miss the pizza party. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I am joining you from LA today. I do live in Fairfax County, um, but I'm so excited to tell you about my journey. So she is being modest this morning. So first of all, she needs to be applauded for her commitment and honoring her word to, to speak to you all today. Let me just share, Omi is in LA. She's in LA because last night she was honored as a woman of vision. This fabulous uh, Thank you. LA Times. Oh, so gosh. what a trooper. So Omi, tell us about your the award, the event. Yeah, there's a, a organization called Visionary Women. And um, out of 110 applicants, by the way, uh, made it to the to the final and uh, was awarded this amazing prize. Uh, it's, it's an awesome women's organization, um, awesome women community on the on the West Coast. And I do a lot of my work on the East Coast. Um, so I'm so excited. I, mean, I do a lot of my work on the East Coast, but I typically am speaking everywhere. So I was just so excited to be honored. I got a great award. Uh, Maria Shriver and her daughters um, spoke and they were very encouraging. And just, I was um, really happy to hear like what they had to say. You know, sometimes you go and you see like famous people, right? Speaking and you never know whether it's a real connection, but they were real people really talking about the projects they're working on and how much they care about women's empowerment. And so it was an amazing night. I got to also commune. I'm all about community. That's why I also hate that I'm not there. Um, I'm all about like building your community and your network because that is one of the keys. I'm gonna talk about it today, but that's actually the key to building your business is building your network. So in this room right now, is somebody who can increase your revenue, help you with your marketing, you know, you help you with new customers, that kind of thing. So it's it's just amazing to be in community. So it was a it was an awesome event. All right. Well, thank you. So Oli, for those of you, for those in the audience that are not familiar with your organization and or you, tell us a little bit about your background. <laughs> so I am a career switcher. Okay, I am a terrible employee. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was the person on the job who's like hey did we say we were gonna fix that because I think we said we we're gonna fix that right and <laughs> it's the thing that nobody wanted to fix um so I worked at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office I was a K-12 educator um, I'm a computer scientist so I taught computer science at T.C. Williams High School um I also worked in workforce development in D.C. And through all of this, I would say categorize myself as a, um, as just a problem solver. And as a single mom of two, uh, while doing all this career switching and getting a degree and things like that. And um, around 2013, um, I was doing a lot of performance poetry and organizing community. So a lot of my organizing community, my community building skills came from art. Um, and so I've been bringing people together, working with different art agencies and performing while working, right? Um, as we do as people, women, we're people of color, we're always like on the ground, we're getting this thing done. And so I was doing both, mainly because in America, America is not necessarily built for one person with multiple children. 
Um, I needed multiple streams of income. So I was always a side hustler and always career switching until I was in a work, working in workforce development uh, at no fault of my own, got laid off. Um, also, a couple of months later, found out I was pregnant and then I also got engaged. So during this entire year, I sort of just went back to performing poetry and building community. Um, and then I told my fiance at the time I wanted to start a business. And he's like, no, I don't think you should do that because we're building our family. It's not, it doesn't feel stable. It doesn't feel like the best thing to do. And I'm sure some of you have heard these type of sentiments. You're going to do what? Why don't you go get that good government job? Go back to being that lawyer. Go back to being an accountant. You know, definitely don't start that brick and mortar. Definitely don't launch this massive business that you probably run now, right? Uh, a lot of people who are worried for you. Um, and so I didn't because I felt like, well, I'm going to be a wife. You know, I think this is maybe this is what women do compromise, work together. You know, you're going to, I want to be a great wife. So I actually went back and started doing some patent search work. And one day my boss called me in and he said, you know what? You're amazing, but this is not for you. And he laid me off and I was devastated. I went home and I called California Psychics. And I said, what is happening to my life? Because I didn't understand. I, I'm not a person that gets laid off, right? Um, and interestingly enough, the woman told me, when you find a thing that you want to do, the money will come and you're not going to be with that guy. So within two months, my entire life flipped upside down. My engagement broke off and I threw everything out of my living room. I started building my own furniture. I think I was in fight or flight mode. But I said, you know what? I'm going to build a business. I don't know what business I'm going to build, but I started looking at what skills do I have? What can my hands do? What, what, what have I learned before? One of the first things I did was I built a tent in my living room and I rented it out on Airbnb. <laughs> Everybody thought I was crazy. I was in Home Depot buying wood. And they're like, what are you doing? I told them I'm going to build this tent in my living room and I'm going to rent it out. And they're like, ma'am, nobody's going to sleep in your living room in a tent. <laughs> and I said, yes, they will watch. I, I don't, honestly, I do not know. Like I bet some of you why I thought this would work, but it did. <laughs> I, <laughs> I built the tent, put it on Airbnb and a woman, she came to stay with me. Um, but after I let that one woman come to stay, I quickly realized what the meaning of safe space was. So my idea behind the tent was if you're a single parent, you can't make extra money off of Airbnb if you don't have an extra room. So how could you make extra money off of Airbnb? Well, you could use your living room. Um, and a lot of times people talk about safe space, safe space. Well, her coming in, she was actually making the space unsafe. She's talking to my children, had a one-year-old. She's trying to get in the tent with the lady. <laughs> um, and so... And so I realized the definition of safe space is safe people. If we all walk into a room and the room is structurally sound, technically we are safe physically. But if we don't learn each other, learn each other's language, read the room, understand how to communicate, you know, and actually connect as humans, then we could be making a space unsafe for other people. So I threw that out the window because that didn't work. And I, at T.C. Williams, I used to do all of the printing for the T-shirts in-house. So I had the T-shirt teacher back then teach me how to do the T-shirts. So I said, you know what? I'm going to launch a T-shirt line. And so <laughs> the first line I launched actually bombed. Nobody bought it. It sucked. I dumped a lot of money into photo shoots and things like that. And nobody bought it. I was on the phone with the printer at the time. And I said, you know what? It's made by a black woman. I should put that on a shirt. And so I went to the computer. I designed a made by a black woman logo to pattern after the Made in America logo. I put it on a shirt and everybody loved it. My mom invested $10,000 of her retirement money into the business. I used my tax returns to buy my own print machines. And then I started printing for other people and printing for my brand at the same time. And it started taking off. And then the print shop through networking actually took off even bigger. And I started doing orders for Amazon and Google. And so by then I'm like, I leveled up my business. I'm selling these shirts and I'm fine. And the news came out. Black women are starting businesses at six times the national average 
yet receiving less than 1% of venture capital. And, you know, me and my problem solving terrible employee self, <laughs> I'm like, I can do something about this. And so I launched Black Girl Ventures in a house in Southeast DC. 30 women showed up. We charged an admission fee at the door. Four women pitched. We voted with marbles and coffee mugs. If you like that person, you put your marble in their coffee mug. And I gave the capital that we raised at the door right back out in cash to the winner. This is patterned after Black history. In the early 1900s, Black people migrated to Harlem and white landowners raised the rent. So Black people threw what's called rent parties in their basements to raise the rent. And they use that capital to stay in their homes. So Black Girl Ventures, that initial signature event that we still do today was patterned after that. Even launching a, this great thing, I still had my own challenges with diversifying my audience. What I realized is that people thought because it was called at that time Black Girl Vision, eventually transitioned that into now Black Girl Ventures, they thought, oh, it's not for me. It must just be for Black people. So it was, it, which is, it was Black people talking to Black people, Black women talking to Black women. Then I eventually got to women talking to women. And then I said, we need the most diverse audience in order to get the most capital to the people in need. The stage doesn't need to be diverse per se. We were sticking with black and brown, but the audience needs to be people of all walks of life from all different backgrounds and ethnicities. So I added a tagline to the business. So it said, everyone can attend, but black and brown women will win. <laughs> Bam, people got it, right? And so then we went from an audience of maybe like 20, 30 people in like small venues, uh, moved into WeWork, which was also a play for bringing in different types of people to see the event. We moved from 20, 30 people to maybe like 80 to 100 people in WeWork. I landed a partnership with Google through my other print relationship, and we went to 300 plus people at a Google office. And through that partnership, I started to scale around the country and go into New York, Atlanta, um, Chicago, Detroit, doing these events. Well, I couldn't charge people to get into Google. So I had to pivot the business model a little bit. Instead of it being charged at the door, give the capital back out to the founder, it, I moved it to vote with your dollars. And so it's like, if you like this person, you vote for them and you donate. We take that in as a nonprofit. Then we grant it back out to that founder. And that's still the what we do today. Now I have proprietary software that I built. So we not voted with marbles and coffee mugs anymore. <laughs> um, and we have three main programs. So we have the signature BGV pitch, which is that community donation and granting program. We have an HBCU program, which is an eight week accelerator for um, HBCU <laughs> students. We're gonna ex expand that to community colleges. And then we have a um, emerging leaders program because we realized that being a business owner is one thing, but to have more voices at the table, we needed to have more business leaders. And so that program is around navigating your local ecosystem and it's across multiple cities. We funded 450 women owned companies to date. We have um, efforts across about 15 cities consistently. We work with large partners like Nike, Visa, PayPal, PIMCO to make these amazing things happen. Um, our founders represent about 10 million in revenue and 3,000 jobs. Did you say 450 companies to date that you yes. have funded? That is Thank you. So, Omi, what advice would you give to some of these aspiring entrepreneurs in the room? Your story is amazing. Thank you. Um, revenue is a validator, right? Your sister's cousin's best friend who once had a, you know, some type of lemonade stand is not the validator, okay? Investors are not the validator. Whether or not you got the funding is not necessarily the validator. Revenue is the validator for whether or not something is working. And I'm saying that because um, not that it's about being driven by money per se, but like if you're in business, I hope you are a little bit driven by money at least. But um, it's about the goal of getting revenue actually causes you to solve problems differently and think about how long you can stay in business and solve your problems. 
it's not going to be perfect when you start out. You are in a new classroom when you start in business. You're figuring it out. All kinds of things will be thrown at you at every level that you're at. At the beginning, um, you're you're kind of zero to five people. You're gonna you could, you're in it. You're kind of working together. You're figuring things out, or you're by yourself and you're figuring things out. When you get to ten plus employees, now you have to create an actual company culture, and so then you're learning new skill sets the entire time. One thing I will also say is like, don't feel like you're starting over if you if you just left a role or a job. You're starting from here, which means everything that you learn counts. My computer science brain and my artist community building brain is what comes together to build Black Girl Ventures. It's all of me. My motherhood, being a mom of now three and raising them, you know, we're the best. Moms are multitaskers, the best savers, the best spenders. Like We're the best. No shade to the guys in the room. But moms rock. And those skill sets are also important when building a business. You're running those that same kind of um, entrepreneurial thinking with what you're doing. So, Omi, there are a number of tech-oriented um, entrepreneurs in the room. And through your Black Girl Ventures, you have seen a number of pitches. So for those techies here that may potentially be pitching to angels or to VCs, what are four kind of strategies or tips for best practices in pitching? So when it comes to the, I'll speak to leading up to and the follow-up of the pitch, because I think that when people ask me this question often, I love the way you worded it because people typically are just asking me, what are tips for pitching? Which is like the actual construction of the pitch. However, there's an entire experience here, right? You're about to stand in front of humans who can be connected to from multiple different avenues. So you want to kind of familiarize yourself, familiarize them with you in just subtle ways. You want to do things like, if you know that they're going to be on the panel of judges, well, one, ask the competitors. If you're in a competition, ask the, the competition organizers who is going to be on the panel and see if they're shut up with you. Another thing is if you're pitching to an angel, uh, one, you want to find people with the best alignment, right? If we all have keys, and there's all door, and then we're in front of a bunch of doors. If our keys don't align with the door, that door is not gonna open. So alignment is key when pitching to VCs and angels. If your company is, you know, um, your, let's say your company is focused on um, debt relief, then you wanna find angels and VCs who are funding tech-centered businesses that are related to finance. You want to find fintech, people who fund fintech. Finding someone who funds anything is not necessarily beneficial for you. Finding someone who funds a different kind of thing than what you have is not necessarily beneficial to you. So you want to make sure you're scouting and looking to pay attention to like, who are they? We're all people. Yes, we have funding to give and investment to give, but we're still people. So appealing to the human spirit is the best possible thing you can do. And backing that up with a business model, knowing your numbers, knowing your um, your competitive market, the market opportunity is important. In the construction of the pitch, it's simple. What is it? Why is it? Why are you for it? Why do I care about it? <laughs> All right, so like, that's very simple. What is it? Why is it? Why you for it? And why do I care about it? The why you for it is extremely important because that goes back to us aligning our values. Investors invest in things that align their value with their values. And I know that's probably not advice or things you may have heard before because most people try to talk about the finance and the money and the business model. If, if an investor is really interested in aligning with your values, the questions they ask you will be different. Um, they'll be asking you promotional questions like how can we get to this place versus but what are you going to do to fix that, right? So when you're in those meetings, you can have your pitch immaculate, but be ready for the Q&A. Be ready to answer questions. Don't feel, sometimes people have trouble talking about money. It's okay if you don't have all of the revenue you're going to have right now. You just have to be able to comprehensively 
talk about where you're going in a way that lets me know you're an expert on this market and on your business and your industry. So your business model is tight and you're able to talk to me about it. You're able to tell, you're able to somewhat give me like a, provide me value that educates me in the moment. People love that. Especially if you're talking to angel investors. It's okay if you get told you're too early. You may get told that a lot. Keep going. Keep going. Find the perfect key for your door. Not perfect, but find the key for your door. Meaning find the person where you and your values align that you want to walk through the same doors together. And I guarantee you, you will get investment. I mean, it's a hard road, right? And it's a lot of like figuring out you know, how does my business model align with what this investor wants? And then when you find the right people, it can, it becomes easier and easier and easier. So, Omi, I have one question for you, one more question for you, and I'm going to open it up to the audience. But tell us a little bit about that book, Originate, Motivate, and Innovate. Awesome. So the, I just uh, have a book that's for pre-order right now um, at Amazon, Books A Million, Walmart, um, Barnes & Noble called Originate, Motivate, Innovate, Seven Steps for Building a Billion Dollar Network. Part of the reason that I created this is because, of course, as you probably heard the themes of, and you may have uh, experienced this yourself, is being the only one in the room. If you're the only woman, if you're the only person of color, and then for me, I'm the only like funky, energetic, hey y'all, what y'all doing? <laughs> you know, the, only, the only Southern, you know, hospitality person in the room sometimes where everybody's like, oh, okay. You know, like I testified in front of Congress maybe uh, two weeks ago now. And I had a purple, bright purple um, dress from an African designer, bright purple lipstick. And I said, I'm going in here and I'm making two statements today that I'm going to be me. And I'm going to testify for what, for this piece of this legislation that I believe in. So I think that like doing that um, can be challenging, you know, especially when there's rooms that I've been in at some places that are a little bit more like exclusive feeling like the Aspen Ideas Festival um, and the places that may even be a little bit more public um, or like on Zoom calls with executives. And you always have this feeling of, Am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Do I look right? Um, you know, am I am I communing with the person? And sometimes you can't tell. So I wrote the book because I want women and people of color to get in the room and stay there. Sometimes we get into the rooms. I, I the premise is like, uh, people tell you if you're the smartest person in your network, you need to get a new network. But nobody <laughs> teaches you how to be the dumbest person in a network. <laughs> The person who knows the least, the person who knows the the, least, the the smallest amount of people in the room. And when there's nobody that looks and feels like you, there's not a lot of instruction on how you navigate those spaces. And so that's what the book is about. Thank you. So we're going to open it up for just a few questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question? If you do, raise your hand. Yes. Good morning, Ami. I, I'm one of your followers, too. Um, that's how I found out about this uh, presentation for today. Um, so we're here in um, Fairfax County in McLean. We've been, my business is a brick and mortar business. We specialize in holistic um, wellness is our program. Um, and we're looking to expand. Uh, we've created a um, proprietary program to assist people in losing um, five pounds naturally through technology, science, um, as well as health and information. And I'm trying to figure out how to move this to the next level. What would be your recommendation in terms of looking for investors or programs that can assist us? Because we're also looking to partner with uh, farmers in order to provide local um, fair to uh, the underserved communities as well as food deserts through our mm -hmm. program. So one, thank you for being an Omi homie. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and sign me up, okay? So <laughs> let's make sure Karen, we can get her information because I need to lose five pounds. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
Thank you for sharing. Okay, so in business, when we say, how do I take it to the next level? One of the things we have to stop and do is like define and acknowledge like what level are we on and what does that mean? And I think like a lot of times as business owners, uh, next level feels like something. Like I just will have more money if I'm on the next level or I will just have more employees if I'm on the next level or I will just have more something. We need to define that. What would you have more of if you're at the next level? Would it be more revenue? Would it be more customers? Would it be more visibility? Would it be larger partners? What would that look like? So I think that's the first step, defining what is next level. Um, most of the time for us as entrepreneurs, it is revenue. Next level would mean I'm bringing in more sustainable capital uh, or I'm, I'm solving some type of problem. And we never know when to hire who when uh, because you're a little bit worried about the investment of the capital into someone. So really you want to look at what stage you're at and what kind of capital you need. Do you need an infusion of capital for sustainability? Do you need to make a play? Excuse me. Do you need to make a play to take you, uh, you have, let's say you have a bit of a runway. Maybe you have a five, six month runway. And you're like, I want to make sure that I can shift the trajectory of my business by going into bigger sectors or working with bigger people. Like I hear you talk, um, working with the farmers. There's a summit, by the way. There's a summit called... Um, the Black Food Summit that's coming up. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it. I'll get the information. I'll see if I can get the information over to Karen. I may be speaking there. That's how I found out about it. Um, so that's what came to mind. I want to make sure I tell you that. But defining what the next level is. So I'm, if you know off the top of your head, do you know what next level would be for you? It's okay if you don't, by the way. No pressure because this is in the moment. Yes, actually, I do know what the next level would do for us. Uh, I'm sorry, my name is Mondere Blassingame. I own the company, The Perfect Storm. So what that company, uh, the reason why we started that, because at, uh, like nine years ago, I was in my own perfect storm. I was borderline diabetic. Um, the doctors were telling me that I needed to lose weight, and then I just didn't know what to do, right? So I know others that are experiencing the same thing. So the goal for us is, at the moment is to curb, to help curb the chronic obesity prevalence. Hold on a second. Hold on one second. <laughs> Tell me your name one more time. Oh, Mondaray. Mondaray. I love that. It's beautiful. Yes. I'm, I'm, pa I'm a pause you for one second. Okay. Because what I, what I want you to tell me is you, all these fantastic people should know about your business. Absolutely. What I want you to tell me is not what the next level will do for you. I want you to tell me what does the next level look like? So like, is that more revenue? Is that more employees? Is that more, fran is that a franchise? Is that like when you say next level, because um, you're a for-profit or non-profit? For-profit. When you get, what does the next level look like? Franchise opportunities. Awesome. Where do you want to go? In, this, in that order. Franchise opportunities okay. for um, low income based um, and urban areas and rural areas, because that's where I'm from. I'm from a small town called Emporia, uh, mm -hmm. south of 90, on 95, about three hours from here. Um, I'm from Durham, so, so I know exactly oh. where you're saying. <laughs> yes, right on 85, 95, 58. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, um, being able to establish franchise opportunities, have more revenue. Um, engage and um, employ uh, uh, women and men, uh, educate the community, and reduce the uh, chronic uh, obesity um, prevalence that's currently here. I love that. We're going to separate those. Next level is franchise, more revenue, hiring more employees. The outcome is that you have um, that you educate the community and you nip in the bud obesity epidemic, right? Those are yes. outcomes. So I want you to focus on the next level will be increased revenue, franchise opportunity, opportunities, and hiring more employees. So with that, each one of these has to have their own strategy. So, and then if franchising is first, there's a lot to visit there. Why the markets that you want to go into and will those build the revenue opportunity for you? 
they may solve the out they may create the outcome of nipping in the bud the obesity epidemic but i'm not exactly sure and, and i'm saying i'm not as sure is that like really that that putting them in urban neighborhoods means that you'll increase revenue unless your customer is a different customer or your partner or how you go about the buildings so i mean like there's more there but ultimately i'll just stop and say you have to develop a strategy for each one of those Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Does anyone else take one more question? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Deshaun Robinson Chu. I'm the founder of She EO Academy. And I follow you also listen to you on Sirius XM with Karen Hunter. I have an issue in scaling. And my issue, I think, in conversations with colleagues is partnering and hiring. And so I want to ask your opinion on partnering and how to find a partner or even if that's necessary to bring in other thoughts, resources. I feel like I've hit a wall in terms of ideas and, and energy. I have a network, but I also have children and a lot. Of, <laughs> and so I have contracts. I just feel like another another person or fresh ideas or some new energy how have you navigated hitting a wall and have you chosen partners resources hire how, how have you managed that yeah one thing is just taking a break um sometimes when you're hammering away hammering away um no the nail still feel like it's going in sideways and you're like taking it back out area you're like what is happening um so uh sometimes it's literally just taking a break um, and I don't mean a long break. So I don't mean like you got to take a week off and like, if you do that, do that, right? If that's your thing. But I literally mean take a break from thinking about it and try to get some, get back to it with fresh eyes. Um, I would say like, are you in any business communities where you can speak about a specific challenge and actually have people help you navigate through it? Um, there's a, locally, I believe there's a 1 million cups um where i would just start about a you and mary and common foundation which is like a group they get together and a person talks about their business and everybody kind of asks them questions and they kind of you know that, that type of environment where you're not the one just having to sit and get but that you can actually be active in the learning or conversation with multiple business owners could be interesting um i also think that i love i love working with partners i think partnerships are the way that you alleviate some of your work and scale at the same time. So the partnership, it, it may bring you more revenue, but some of it, you may decide on partners that just take away some of your work, right? Um, and partners that do what they do very well, and then they take away and, and you can come together. And now you're getting done two things you wanted to get done without you having to do all the work. That frees you up for you to look at a bigger partnership. So some partnerships may not be big revenue hits, but they will uh, lighten your load a bit. So there may be just either lateral revenue or just a slight increase, but accepting those partners takes away some of the work that you may have to do. Therefore, you can focus on scale. So I would say, think about partnerships that make sense that way. Sit down and map your network. I can give you a really simple way to do it quickly it is like a bullseye, right? So just put a couple rings on the bullseye in the center are the people, and I'll say that you could go to right now and just ask for a favor. Hey, I need to do this. Hey, I need to know that. Hey, can you, where could I get X, Y, and Z money? Hey, will you give me some money? Like, those are your people in the middle. As you go further and further out, you're going to start to go out. Concentrated folks, you can go get a favor from right now. Next layer is people that, like, it may take some work, but they will show up for you. You go out another ring, and these are people that you're going to have to do a little bit more networking with, a little bit more education. But these people um, are ripe and ready for your industry or your particular business to get engaged. When you look at this network, you're going to pick and choose who you're going to meet with, who you're going to act, what you're going to ask for, and how you navigate advice. So asking for advice is a value add for both people. I told, I told somebody recently, a group of people I was talking to, that a hack is I've asked for advice for things I didn't even need advice on for the sake of building a relationship 
and getting into conversations with people where we could really get to know each other. And then they open up and say, oh, you know what? Now that I'm talking about it, just like um, when she said she was talking about the farmers, I'm like, oh, shoot. You know, you should be at the Black Food Summit. Like, I think like these are, you want people to light up when they talk to you and you want to be able to light up when you talk to them. But net, map that network out, like literally write it out and then look at it and say, hmm, who here could I go ask advice from that we would add value to each other? Thank you. Thank you for that advice. I see a lot of people taking notes. So we have time for just two. I'm going to add two lab, two questions remaining. Um, your business is located in Fairfax County. How has that been advantageous for you? Well, I've been living, I'm from Durham, North Carolina. I've been living in Fairfax County specifically for almost 20 years, I guess. I put two children through high school at Mount Vernon High School, you know, elementary, middle, high school. I think that um, proximity for where I live has been great, meaning like, you know, there's one, everything is pretty accessible. When I started, I did go to like the SBDC near me. Uh, there was one right over on Lowesdale Road, and there that was like one of my first stops. Um, I learned a lot from being there, good, bad, right, wrong, and indifferent about about what I wanted to do with my business and who I needed help from. Because I mean, learning who you need help from is also a thing, by the way, right? Like at first, you're just like, everybody can help me. You're like, this person who looks like they're on a pedestal can help. And then you start talking to them and you're like, oh, actually you're figuring it out. Like I'm figuring it out. Um, and I went through that a lot of times, but building that muscle up was great. Um, in Virginia, starting a business is fairly easy. So I think that like in the, the fees that you pay annually have been great. Um, I feel like there's lots of access to, it's just navigating it can be, because it's so much sometimes trying to find everything and the county is so huge, um, trying to find everything. And I am right now, I don't know where people in the room live, but I'm advocating and about to launch some things over on the Mount Vernon Richmond Highway side of town because uh, everything happens out in Reston, out in Tyson's, out, and that's great. Um, and I went to those things and through that, I was able to meet amazing people. And now I feel like I want some of that uh, to have that innovation innovation conversation happen on my side of the town, down near Lorton and Springfield and the Fort Belvoir base and in that area, all up and down Richmond Highway. And thank you for your commitment and for doing it. That is amazing. So I have one last question for you. What's next for you and for Black Girl Ventures? World domination. No, um, <laughs> for, for Black Girl Ventures, uh, we're continuing to scale. We are actually looking at um, branching out into the UK. Um, we launched in L.A., uh, last year so we're going to continue to kind of focus on the regions and if you know give me my like dream big I don't just want to be a player I want Black Girl Ventures to be the league right and so what I'm doing is we planted ourselves across different regions across the country and eventually I want to be able to create big money opportunities and bigger competitions where like you enter into the ecosystem of Black Girl Ventures and you are in this very robust uh, community um, access to capital and soon to be like regional competitions. So, I mean, like for us, it's scale home at home here in the U.S., but we're also looking at starting community across the diaspora, um, starting with the U.K. For me, well, this is my seventh year of Black Girl Ventures. Um, I love I love what I do on the media side. Um, as she mentioned, I'm on a Karen Hunter show. In fact, I'll be on there today. And I have my own Sirius XM show on Sundays at noon um, on Channel 126 as well. And I love bringing those stories um, to people to be able to listen to business owners everywhere. I, I don't know what my next thing would be. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I have, I'm not going to, I will be at Black Revenge a few more years, maybe. 
Um, and then I'll hand it over to a great leader because I feel like the sign of a great leader is understanding when it's time to succession plan and uh, find somebody that can lead in your place. And I'll move to the board and I'll keep charging on for women in general because I have a huge passion for women's economic empowerment and women's empowerment in general. Uh, so I'll probably write a few more books, commune uh, with people, build community, continue. I want to produce a few films and things like that. Storytelling is big for me. So long story short, for me personally, I can't tell you at this moment. <laughs> But um, for Black Girl Ventures, we're going to continue to scale and help as many women, women as we can. Okay. So, Omi, it has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. We wish you continued blessings for success. Again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Omi. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can find me at omibell.com at Omi Bell on Instagram. Also, uh, like I said, join me uh, on Twitter. It's um, the Omi Bell. And tune in on Sundays, uh, Sirius X and Urban View Channel 126 at noon. All right. Thank you. All so right. Much. Have a great rest of your day.